Good morning. Welcome to the 2019 Midwest Bible Prophecy Conference. A lot of things are happening in our world, and uh, hopefully we'll get some clarification on what's going on in our world today through through the Word of God. It's great to have you. I know some of you have traveled a short distance since you get here, so uh, I'm sure you're wor worth your time. I'm going to introduce our speaker just in a moment. We sent Lee off uh, a few glitches. So, uh, how are we? Are we ready to go? By faith. The best way to start is with prayer, so let's do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, to uh, just present this conference, and we pray that it edify the saints, evangelize the lost, and above all, exalt your name. So, here we are, Lord. You know all the details, all the techy stuff that needs to be smoothed out, and we just pray that you take care of all of that. We thank you for our first speaker, Nathan, who's come to share with us from uh, from the Dallas area, and we're, we're just grateful for his ministry and uh, what you're doing and his life and family. So, Father, we thank you for the beginning of this day, and we commit this day into your hands for good success and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'd like to introduce Nathan Jones, Bible prophecy teacher and speaker, author, uh, he co-hosts Lamb and Lamb Ministry. Well, that's Lamb and Lion Ministry, right? Uh, with uh, David Reagan. And uh, their website is uh, ChristinProphecy.org. Wonderful, wonderful site. A wealth of information. I hope you <coughs> share something about them. And he does serve as an associate evangelist and webmaster for Lamb and Lion Ministry. He's the web developer for that ministry. Nathan is the author, author and author. Got one of his books in the word that's back there. Uh, Twelve faith journeys of the minor prophets, and he's a daily blogger. He discusses current event events on Facebook and on different radio programs throughout the country. Takes questions from literally all over the world. So we're just blessed to have Nathan with us this morning. So welcome, Nathan Jones. Whew. I spent the last hour with the tech team duking it out over technology. I don't know why, but as one of the tech guys at Lamb and Lion Ministries, the tech never works wherever I go. So I don't know if I'm cursed or not, but that team is awesome. I think, let me just, let's see. Uh-oh. Hold it. Okay. We're getting things together. Oh, nope. We're almost there. We're almost there. This is a big crowd for a Saturday morning. I normally don't wake up till like 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. This is impressive. I'm so glad you could come. All right, ready? Oh, oh, oh. thank you guys. All righty, well, let me put this down here so you can see my, I'm very short. There you go. Okay, well, let me tell you a little bit about Lamb and Lion Ministries before I get into this. Uh, as the pastor demonstrated, it's not an easy ministry name to remember. Some call us the Lemon and Lime Ministries. We've been called the Lame Lion Ministries. There is a Lion and Lamb Ministries, but it's a, kind of a Hebrew Roots cult thing. So sometimes those folks contact us and I share the gospel with them. But we are Lamb and Lion Ministries because Jesus came first as a suffering lamb, but he's coming back as a conquering lion. Now, we're a Bible prophecy ministry, a teaching ministry whose mission it is to proclaim the soon return of Jesus Christ. We believe that the Lord is coming back in our time, in our generation. And as the course of this conference goes, we will make the case for that. It was founded by Dr. David Reagan, who's our founder and director. And I am the, uh, now my title changed to make it easier. It's just internet evangelist. I am the internet evangelist for the ministry. That's our crew there. Minus my wife, who does the encoding and transcribing for our TV shows. Don't tell her she's not in the picture. I got a picture up over there. All right, there's our television show. How many of you watch Christ in Prophecy? Excellent, excellent. The rest of you, I want to introduce you to Christ in Prophecy. It's our 17th season so far, and we're on all sorts of networks. Uh, we're up to 32 networks now. You can find us online. You know, if I hold my hand out like Darth Vader, it works, so I'm just going to do that thing here. 
All right, so what is an internet evangelist? Because you're like, what? I've heard of preachers and teachers and all, but this internet evangelist thing, well, I spend most of my time reaching out to the three billion plus people who are online over the internet. And I do that primarily through our website called ChristinProphecy.org or LambLion.com. Check us out. We've got a wealth of information. We also have a conference coming up in July if you want to come down to the Dallas area. I also blog on our Christ and Prophecy Journal blog. So there's over 2,000 articles about Bible prophecy. We create a lot of videos. I'm going to show you some of those videos today and tomorrow. But we're trying to reach people where they're at. And where they're at increasingly is on the Internet. Also, their intention spans are decreasing. So we try to make short videos to reach people. And that's called the Inbox and the Bible Prophecy Insight Series. Find us on social media. Check us out. Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, whatever your, your fancy social media, we try to be on there. I really do have to hold my hand out for this to work. It's crazy. We also go on tours. Have you ever been to Israel? Okay, you'll want to go to Israel with us. We're going three times this year. It makes the Bible come alive when you stand where those Bible stories were that you read about. We also have a lot of resources. I brought a bunch of resources in the back. Most of them are free. Please take them. But if you'd like to see our complete collection of resources to help you grow in the Bible, that's BibleProphecyResources.com. Create a lot of DVDs, the teaching DVDs. I brought the Fate of Islam with me because I'll be teaching about that later this afternoon. But we have, I don't know, 50 or so DVDs. We got books and magazines. Like the pastor said, I brought my book. Uh, I've been in a few other books, and I'm almost finished my second book. So I'm a baby compared to some of these other students. Why did you see Dr. Ice come here? I think he's got like 25 books to his name. So I'm, I'm, I'm the new guy on the block here. We also have a magazine called The Lamp Lighter that you can subscribe. It comes out every month, or you can get it free off our website. We have an app. How many of you do all your studying on the app? We have the, just look up Lamb Lion, and you can download our app for free, any device. And I get emails, lots of Bible question emails. I answer the emails at the ministry, and sometimes people like to send our founder church signs because he's really big on church signs. Here's two of the church signs that folks send. If you got church signs you like, you please send them in. I don't know why, but a lot of these church signs must be by disgruntled employees because the pastors always end up looking bad. <laughs> All righty. Let's go ahead and switch to the second PowerPoint, and I'll go ahead and begin the message for today. While doing that, let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for this opportunity to get together with these good people here in Indiana to have a conference. Thank you for Pastor Bell and the great staff here, Lord, who are making it possible. Thank you for all those who are tuned in through streaming video. We welcome them. Lord, I pray that you'll touch each and every one of us this day. Lord, help us to have no problems. Keep Satan away, all this tech issues we're having. Uh, may there be none of that be today, Lord. May this all day be for your honor and glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. Okay. Now, I'm sorry if I'm going to look weird, you know, like I'm using the force here, but unless I move the podium up a few feet, this is my range. Okay. Now, you are going to hear many presentations today, and some of them might not be the happiest of presentations. Matter of fact, there's a wide misconception that Bible prophecy is all negative. It's all doom and gloom. It's only that because of the era we live in. The era we live in is starting to see, as you've noticed, if you even turn on the news, that the world is going crazy. And it's going crazy for a reason, because it's reaching a perfect future. What I want to do to start the conference is start it with the end in sight, so that you don't fall into despair as you hear some of our presentations today, because it's a rough time right now. But it's a short time right now. The true glory is the kingdom of Christ, and that's what's coming. So let's start this off, I think, on the right foot by having the big picture view, how it's all going to turn out. Okay? All right, let me ask you this. What do these empires and nations have in common? Babel? Egypt? Babylon? The Incan Empire, the Roman Empire, the British Empire, the United States, and the European Union. 
What do all these nations and empires have in common? They failed. Every one of these have failed. And what have they failed at doing? They've failed at eliminating human suffering. A government is created to protect its citizens, but it cannot seem to protect its citizens from lawlessness, natural disasters, hunger, disease, war, and human suffering. That's what human government's for, and yet it cannot seem to do that. In my book, 12 Faith Journeys of the Minor Prophets, I write about 12 minor prophets, a section of the Bible that is rarely read, because each of the minor prophets overcame a challenge to their faith. And one of those prophets was named Micah. And Micah had a big challenge to his faith. How do you keep the faith when human government has failed you? Well, Micah did learn to keep the faith, and when lamenting about how failed government is, he wrote this. The faithful man has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among men. The prince asks for gifts. The judge seeks a bribe, and the great man utters his evil's desire. So they scheme together. What is government, human government, defined by? Corruption. So is there any hope that mankind will be freed of the failure of our own flawed governments, or are we destined forever to have to suffer under its weight? Well, the prophet Daniel gives us the answer. Oop, make it, wow, okay, let's go back here. Okay, the prophet Daniel had interpreted King Nebuchadnezzar's vision, and he had this dream that there was this great statue and the head of the statue, the gold, was him. That was the Babylonian Empire. And the Babylonian Empire would give way to the Medo-Persian Empire, which conquered it, and that was the arms of silver. And that would be taken over by the Greek Empire, which is the belly of bronze, and that would be taken over by the Roman Empire. And then as the Roman Empire went on, it fragment into what is the European Union, and then coalesce at the very end of what we today have as the European Union. That is the main empires that Daniel saw prophesied through this. But Nebuchadnezzar also saw this. He saw a stone not cut out by human hands come crashing out of the sky, hit the statue, blow it up, and turn it into dust. Human government would end, and it would be replaced by the kingdom of Christ. Human government will end, and it would be replaced by the kingdom of Christ. Now, what am I talking about when I say the kingdom of Christ? Let's explore the kingdom of Christ. Back in the day, the Puritan pastor, Cotton Mather, and if you ever wonder why his mama named him Cotton, just you know, check out that hair there. <laughs> Cotton explained the kingdom of Christ as a four-part kingdom, threefold kingdom of Christ with a fourth yet to come. First, it would be a spiritual kingdom, wherein his word and grace rule over the consciences of men. It was also a providential kingdom, wherein he governs all the affairs and motions of the world. It's a ecclesiastical kingdom, wherein he appoints and prospers the ordinance of a church state. And then finally, a Davidic kingdom, which belongs unto our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, 2 Samuel 7 explains that Davidic kingdom. I will set up your seed after you, this is God talking to David, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So Nathan spoke to David. Whenever a prophet named Nathan speaks to you, make sure you listen. <laughs> now, was God talking about a literal kingdom or a literal seed on a literal throne over a kingdom that will last literally forever, or is the Davidic kingdom rolled up in just the other three? Now, before I answer that question, I want to read to you what the Bible has to say about this kingdom of Christ. And we're going to do it following what's called the golden rule of interpretation. If the plain sense makes sense, don't look for any other sense, lest you end up with nonsense. Oh, wow, your pastor has taught you all well, yes. 
So, we are going to take the Bible at its plain sense meaning, all right? First, we're going through the different aspects of the kingdom of Christ. And the first one, it begins with Jesus' promise to return. Do you know how Revelation chapter 22 ends? It ends with a promise from Jesus Christ himself that is so important, he repeats it three whole times. The Bible promises that Jesus will one day return. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. When Jesus makes a promise, you can be 100% sure that it will come true. So, based on that promise, is tied to the Jews being regathered to Israel. The promise of Jesus is tied to one of the most significant prophecies in the entire Bible. It's tied to the fact that the Lord would bring the Jewish people who have been scattered all over the earth since 70 AD back into the land of Israel. The prophet Jeremiah tells us, For I am with you, says the Lord, to save you, though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you. Yet I will not make a complete end of you, but I will correct you in justice, and will not let you go altogether unpunishment. Now, the reason for the scattering of the Jews by God was they because of their unfaithfulness. They're, they just could not get over their sins. They were continually cheating on him spiritually, so to speak. But it was only a punishment meant for a time. The exile wasn't meant to last forever. And when the Jews returned, it would be an indicator that human government would soon be no more. There we go. Run back. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So the Jews were scattered when the Babylonians took them over, but they came back. Isaiah prophesied a second time when the Jews would be regathered from the world. It took 2,500 years since the initial exile from Babylon. But what is going on today, according to Zechariah 8? I will bring them back, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people. I will be their God in truth and righteousness. So the Jewish people are being brought back from the land of, to the land that God promised Abraham. In the midst of Israel, and in the capital, Jerusalem. And God is bringing them back to fulfill a promise that they will, a remnant, come to salvation and be their people. They'll love truth and righteousness and are committed to him. The Lord's working through the church, but he hasn't forgotten his promises to Israel. And that leads up to the day of the Lord. Now, you and I have alive to see this happening. We, in our own age, we are watching Bible prophecy, major Bible prophecy, being fulfilled right before our eyes. May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation once more, and in June 1967, took control over the city of Jerusalem. The hands of the land of Israel is back in his Israeli government. But the hearts of the people in Israel are still not with, you know, it's about 85% of the Jewish people consider themselves secular humanists. That's a, that's a large number. They haven't yet come. Their hearts haven't been given to their king yet. So God has to work on their hearts by fulfilling yet another prophecy, which is called the day of the Lord. The prophet Zeph Zephaniah tells us, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities, against the high towers. I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out there like dust, and their flesh like refuse. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. So, Zephaniah described a time when the wrath of God was going to be poured out on the whole world because of their sin. Now, we read about these horrific judgments in the book of Revelation. And it describes 21 judgments from God coming down upon this earth. And by the time those 21 judgments are done, 
Most of the earth will be destroyed and most of the population. The ecology of the world will be on a brink. Zechariah tells us, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity. But the remnant of my people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem to the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north and half move towards the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. So Zechariah is describing the end of what's called the tribulation time period. The day of the Lord where, it, where things in this earth get so bad that it forces people to their knees and to turn to Jesus Christ in repentance. This world leader that will rise during that time, the Antichrist, leads a nat global army, every nation in the world, to attack Jerusalem. He tries to destroy it, but that's when Jesus comes back. And when Jesus lands, he lands with such force that it splits the Mount of Olives in two. You ever watch the Avengers movies? Incredible Hulk hits the ground, the ground breaks. Hulk's got nothing on Jesus. He will make a valley, he hits it so hard, and the Jews will be able to flee out of Jerusalem and away from the Antichrist. Haggai 2 tells us, And I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. Jesus Christ, the enraged warrior king, returns to personally and by him to self defeat all the Antichrist and his armies. And he doesn't just fight. He hasn't have to. He speaks. And the people, it says, just fall apart. He takes the molecules and just breaks them apart. So Daniel's rock, not cut out by human hands, will smash the statue of world government under the Antichrist, and the Christ kingdom will come to fill the whole earth. Well, let's look at the aftermath because it's anxious to get up there. There it is. I do apologize. This should be here, but it's now back there. Okay. Daniel 12 tells us, And from that time the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up. There should be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits to the 1,335 days. And you're like, what are you talking about, Nathan? Well, let me just get to the math. There's 75 extra days after this seven-year tribulation where God is going to judge the world. And he does it in Matthew 25 called the sheep goat judgment. The Lord is going to separate the survivors of the tribulation. Those who have rejected him and followed the Antichrist are considered the goats. They're put on the left and they're sent to Hades to await final judgment. But those on the right, those who accepted Christ and suffered through that terrible time, they will follow Jesus and they are called the sheep and they are the population that will move into the kingdom of Christ. That's where we get the population for the kingdom of Christ. Now, let's get to the fact that the, what defines the kingdom of Christ is that the Messiah reigns. The Messiah has returned as promised and he reigns. And the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It shall stand forever. King Jesus is returning to destroy Satan's rule, to overthrow human government, and set up his own kingdom on this earth. And it will never pass away. I mean, think about that. What empire has lasted more than even, say, the Roman Empire for a thousand years. They don't. They fall apart eventually. America, sadly, will fall apart one day. It's just the, what human government does. But Jesus' kingdom will last forever. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. Famous Christmas verse, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it in establishment with judgment and justice from that time forward, even 
forever. Now, look at the characteristics in yellow of what defines the kingdom of Christ. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Look how the kingdom of Christ is characterized. Righteousness, justice, faithfulness. Imagine if we had governments like that today. Isaiah tells us, He will bring forth justice for truth, He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. The defining characteristic of the kingdom of Christ is justice. I don't know about you, but we're not seeing much justice coming out of our government lately. Jesse Smollett. We have seen that there is a problem with human government. But look upon Zion, the city of our appointed feasts, and your eyes will see Jerusalem there the majestic Lord will be. Jesus' seat over his kingdom will be placed in Jerusalem. Now, you wonder why the whole world seems to be fascinated with taking over Jerusalem. For those of you who've been to Jerusalem, it's a nice town, but there's some better towns in this world, you have to admit. Why is everybody obsessed with taking over Jerusalem? Because the satanic forces behind it know that that's where Jesus will return and set up his kingdom. Micah tells us, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be exalted on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And the peoples shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion, the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations far off. It says that Jerusalem will be on the mountaintops. Now, this is interesting because it's led some theologians to believe that as the topography of the earth changes during the tribulation, that Jerusalem may actually be lifted up to be one of the highest points in the world. And all the nations, this verse tells us, the people will stream to speak to directly, to speak to Jesus, to hear his law, to hear his words. I don't know about you, but you try to get in the White House and speak to the president. You're not going to do it. But Jesus will be fully accessible. You have to go and talk to him and hear his words. Isaiah tells us, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. So this reveals that there will still be kings over the earth who rule under the king of kings, but all the glory and power will be to the king of kings, King Jesus. Daniel tells us, Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And if anyone believes that they can overthrow Jesus Christ, they are woefully deluded. And we'll cover that in just a minute. All right, the next aspect of the kingdom of Christ is, hopefully coming up, that the world knows the Lord. That the world knows the Lord. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Can you believe that? That every person on the earth will know Jesus personally. They'll visit him at least once a year. There'll be no need for mission work anymore, for the gospel would have been already spread. The good news would be completed. The Great Commission finally over. In his days, wow. Let's go back here. Wow, that really uh, skipped ahead. Do this, guys. Just turn it off. I'm sorry. All my cool, neat visuals. It's not worth me looking like a bird over here. I'm just going to read, okay? All right. You're just going to have to picture it in your head, right? No jazzy stuff. Okay. 
For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, Psalm 22 also tells us, All the ends of the world shall remember the turn to turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. The Lord will finally receive all the worships that's due him, because Jesus has earned his thanks and praise as King of kings and Lord of lords. For from the rising of the sun even to the going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and every place incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. I don't know about you, but I am tired of hearing Jesus' name be used as a swear word all the time. Do you know, finally, that Jesus will get the honor that he deserves? Matter of fact, he will even get a new name. Jeremiah tells us, In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name, by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Now in Hebrew, which, folks, I don't know if we're all going to be speaking Hebrew during this time, but if it is, you got to start practicing now because his name will be Yahweh Sidkenu. Can you say that? Yahweh Sidkenu. It means the Lord our righteous. Hopefully you'll let us say it in English. Okay, number seven. The seventh aspect of the kingdom of Christ is that Jerusalem will be the capital city of the world. Zechariah tells us, Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts. He also says, Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, and the holy mountain. Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. Can you imagine that? Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. Zechariah tells us, In that day holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Isaiah says, And it shall come to that pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem. Jerusalem won't be a city that's mixed with really. Have you ever gone to Jerusalem? It is one of the most pagan cities because all the world religions claim it as its capital. Humanism, Islam, Judaism, Roman Catholicism, Orthodox, they all claim it as their capital. You see people kissing icons and worshiping statues all over the place, but not during the kingdom of Christ. The kingdom of Christ, everybody will worship the Lord as is due. Even the bells and the pots will be inscribed to say, holy is the Lord on it. Now, the next aspect, the eighth aspect of the kingdom of Christ has to do with King David. Yes, the King David of the Old Testament. Jeremiah 30 says, But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. And Ezekiel tells us, I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. My servant David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I the Lord will be their God, and my servant David a prince among them. So King David has been promised to rule during this millennial kingdom, this thousand-year kingdom, this kingdom of Christ, from Jerusalem. Probably like a mayor, because Jesus Christ is the king of kings. So David has a part in it. Now, there will be a temple in this kingdom of Christ. There's an eastern gate. For those of you who know, there's this closed gate around the city, and it's been closed because it's waiting for the Messiah to return. And when Jesus returns, he will blow open that gate. He will ascend up there, Whatever happened to the Dome of the Rock, the Islamic mosque up there will be gone, and he will start a temple. Zechariah 6 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So Jesus will come, and that third temple that Antichrist desecrated, no more. Jesus will build a temple for the millennium, a place for him to sit, to rule, as well as to receive worship and to uh, fellowship with people. It's going to be much bigger. Matter of fact, the dimensions that Ezekiel tells us, it'll be big enough to sit on the entire existing city of Jerusalem right now. So it's going to be the new Jerusalem that's going to not... I'll get ahead of myself. But the Jerusalem for the millennial kingdom will be a very large city. Isaiah says, Even then I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Now, 
That's one of the little odd things the Bible tells us that the sacrificial system seems to start up again during the kingdom of Christ. It's a question that we get at every Bible conference, and the answer is, I have no idea why. Some people believe that it has something to do with a, maybe purification rites. Maybe it's a commemorate a, another system. I don't think it's going to be as vast as it was in the Old Testament, but there are sacrifices again at this temple. Now, another fact about the kingdom of Christ is that the Jewish people will be exalted. Are the Jewish people exalted today? No. I, goodness sake, the UN seems to exist to do nothing more than try to destroy them. Hosea says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For my anger is turned away from him. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Now, the Jewish people during the millennial kingdom, this kingdom of Christ, remember, they got saved during the tribulation. Every one of them going in is saved. This is the saved remnant that the Lord was talking about. And they will be a priestly people during that time people, during that time period, and the Jews in turn will be a blessing to the world. Zechariah 8 tells us, Thus says the Lord of hosts in those days, Ten men from every language of the nations will grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So the righteous Jewish people during the kingdom of Christ will be a priestly people, and they will serve to connect the Gentile world, those who got saved during the tribulation and are living into the, uh, this kingdom of Christ, to Jesus Christ. Zephaniah 3 says, At that time I will bring you back, even at the time I gather you, for I'll give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth. And when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. Now, such a priestly position comes with the esteem of the world, and the Jews will be honored for their service to God. Isaiah 49 says, Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their faces to the earth, and lick up the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So the kings and the queens of the Gentile nations that will form as the tribulation saints have children and those children and, and the whole planet is filled with people again. And Israel will finally get its borders. The borders from Egypt to the Euphrates River will finally be in control of Israel. Next, the kingdom of Christ is also defined that the saints reign. The saints reign. It talks about kings, queens, mayors, and regents. Well, Daniel says, But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. And Daniel 7 says, Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. Folks, who are these saints of the Most High? Well, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're the saints. We're the ones that ride back with Jesus at the second coming. We're the ones that watch Jesus defeat evil and set up his kingdom. And we're the ones promised to rule and reign over the people of this earth. How will we look? I think we'll look young. We'll be in our glorified bodies. And we'll be teachers, kings, queens, administrators, law enforcement. If you're retired, anybody here retired? Yeah, going back to work. Sorry about that. But it'll be a wonderful work. Revelation 20 tells us, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. These are talking about the Christians who will die during the tribulation. After the rapture, there will be a seven-year tribulation. People will come to Christ as Savior. The Antichrist will slaughter many of them. They, too, are promised to rule and reign with Christ. Now... This time period, how is it defined? It is defined as a time of joy. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance and the young men and the old together, for I will turn their mourning to joy and will comfort them and make them rejoice rather than sorrow. The kingdom of Christ is a time period defined by peace, righteousness, and justice, but also a great time of joy and happiness. Zechariah 14 tells us, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles will be reinstituted. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, well, there will be no rain on them. So it seems that for God to keep fellowshipping with people, he reinstitutes the Feast of Tabernacles, that people get to see Jesus every year, and for those who decide not to show up, well, 
he turns the rain off, this kind of reminder, come back. Interesting. Now, the 13th aspect of the kingdom of Christ is a time defined as a time of peace without war. Isaiah and Micah both prophesied, They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Or well, listen to this, Bow and sword of battle, I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down safely. Now, how long has mankind been trying to end war? How long have we been having peace conference after peace conference that's failed? But just think, a time period of no war, no soldiers, no weapons, no hatred towards our fellow man. How much of our budget in each country goes to war? What will we do with all that money if it went to peace and building and infrastructure? Do you see how amazing that this kingdom of Christ could be? Even so amazing is the animals will be at peace. Isaiah prophesies, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. Isn't that amazing? The animal kingdom will not be at war with humanity anymore. Little kids can stick their hands in vipers' nests and not get bitten. Lambs and lions are actually, well, I feel bad for the lions. They would be quite depressed. But they will not, the lions will eat straw again. We'll become vegetarians, it would appear. Now, that is kind of depressing too, but, you know. But the land will be bountiful. Regardless of what we're eating, the land will be bountiful. Amos 9 tells us, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows seeds. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with it. Zechariah tells us, For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give its fruit, and the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give her due. I will cause the remnant of the people to possess this. So the kingdom of Christ is going to be a time of fantastic agricultural bounty. And it tells us this in Zechariah 14, And in that day it shall be that the living waters will flow from Jerusalem, half towards the eastern sea and half towards the western sea. And when it reaches the sea, the waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live. Now, this is a prophecy about the Dead Sea. How many of you have been to the Dead Sea on your Israel tours? It's dead, right? There is nothing living in it because there's no outlet. The salts over the years have filled it up. It, you can't live in it. But a new river will be coming out of Jerusalem, the Bible says, and it will make the Dead Sea alive again. There will be fishermen on the shores fishing, so the whole world will be brought to life again. The Bible also describes the kingdom of Christ as having plains, the plains of the earth. Isaiah 40 says, Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low, the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. So during the day of the Lord, Revelation 6 and other chapters describe there will be four great earthquakes during the tribulation that will level most of the world. But Jerusalem, the Bible says, will be lifted up. So it seems that the mountains as we know them now will be no more during the kingdom of Christ. Another aspect of the kingdom of Christ is long life. Long life. Isaiah 65 says, No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who is not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people." You thought that, that these people live it up to a thousand years before the flood. That's just some kind of fluke of the Bible. No, they live that long. And the Bible promises they will live that long again. Amazing. And the inhabitants will not say, I am sick. And the people do dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. Isaiah tells us the eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer. And the tongue of the lung dumb sing. In other words, physical infirmity will also be no more. Now, I'm not saying the entire curse is lifted. That's for later. But the curse will be partially lifted and humanity will be recharged back to that pre-flood existence again. And what's also wonderful about the kingdom of Christ is that Satan will be bound that entire time. 
Revelation 20 tells us, Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, have the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he could not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So Revelation 20 reveals two things about the kingdom of Christ. When Jesus returns at his second uh, coming, he's going to have Satan bound and thrown into this bottomless pit so that he can deceive the nations no more. Nobody during the kingdom of Christ can say, Satan made me do it, or one of his demons tempted me. They won't be there. They'll be off the earth. It also says that Satan will be in prison for a thousand years. Now, six times in Revelation 20, we're told that the kingdom of Christ will last a thousand years, 1,000 literal years. So we know for a fact that this time period has a beginning and an end. Now, let's talk about the end. Revelation 20 says, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are on the four corners of the earth and to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up to the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. The fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived him was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Wow. I don't know about you, but they should get an amen out of that, because that's it. Satan is finally defeated. Why does God release Satan at the end? Because humanity always has a choice to choose Jesus or not. Now, they need a rallying point, and Satan has always existed as a rallying point for those who wish to rebel against God. Now, one of the most tragic stories in the Bible is this story. It's estimated there might be 20 billion people living on this planet with the health and the long lives. And it says, like the sand of the sea, when Satan's released, they will gather to rebel against Jesus Christ. I mean, to think, they grew up in a utopia, but a utopia is not enough for the human heart. The human heart is fallen and wicked and seeks to rebel against God. And these people, these children born during the millennial kingdom, many of them, will side with Satan. Satan always thinks if he gets enough people together, he can overthrow God. But God doesn't waste time. Psh, fire, they're incinerated, and that's that. And Satan is cast to hell, where he'll be forever. Good. I know this isn't a Baptist church. Uh, now I know. I mean, like, well, I thought these Calvary chapels were a little more... Eh. No, Tom's like, no, okay. Let's talk about final judgment. How will the kingdom of Christ end? We're almost done, folks. Revelation 20 says, Then I saw a great white throne in him who sat on it, who from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was no place for him. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And their dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead that were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is final judgment, the great white throne judgment. This is where God will resurrect those who have rebelled against him that are dwelling in Hades. If you die in sin, you go to a place called Hades where you await final judgment. This final judgment is over the works that these people did in life. Unfortunately, they're missing the one work that matters the work of Jesus Christ did on the cross, the one that forgives them of their sins. And found wanting, they will be thrown into the lake of fire along with Hades itself. Hades will also be thrown there. And that's where they will face their punishment. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Then comes the end, when he delivers, Jesus, the kingdom of God to the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign till he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Now, when all these things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will be all subject to him who put things under him, that God may be all in all. What do we have by the end of the kingdom of Christ? We have returned to the Garden of Eden. Isn't that amazing? After a thousand years, Jesus' rule and reign, all his enemies will defeat it, including death. And then we get into the eternal state. But that's another story, and one I'll tell you Sunday morning. All right. I'm sorry for the technical issues. Do I have enough time to show the video? 
All right, I just downloaded a fire spout of information on you. I'm gonna sum it up in one short video, okay? And then we'll be done. Thank you. <coughs> Jesus wraps up the entire Bible in Revelation 22 with a promise stating, Surely I am coming quickly. He proclaims this not once. Jesus wraps up the entire Bible in Revelation 22 with a promise, stating, Surely I am coming quickly. He proclaims this not once, not twice, but three whole times, making the fact of his return to set up his kingdom an ironclad pledge. But you have to wonder, since it's been 2,000 years already, did Jesus merely mean his return was symbolic, or will there be an actual, literal appearance one day? Will Jesus rule the earth for a thousand years? Why the debate this symbolic or literal return of Jesus to set up his kingdom? To answer that, let me introduce you to Cotton Mather, a Puritan pastor from 18th century New England. Cotton explained that, in truth, the kingdom of Christ was a threefold kingdom with the fourth yet to come. First, it's a spiritual kingdom wherein his word and grace rule over the consciences of men. At the same time, second, it's a providential kingdom wherein Jesus directs the affairs of this world. And third, it's an ecclesiastical kingdom where Jesus rules as the head over the church. But then Cotton explained that the kingdom of Christ has a fourth aspect that still is yet to be instituted, a Davidic kingdom where Jesus rules and reigns physically over all the earth. It's taking all four of these folds together that can trip people up, for they'll recognize the first three, but often neglect the fourth, the Davidic kingdom. The prophet Daniel told us that the Davidic kingdom and human government would never coexist. Daniel, too, tells the story of the great King Nebuchadnezzar, who awoke to a very disturbing dream. He dreamt of a massive statue with a head of gold, a chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, two legs made out of iron, and feet a mixture of iron and clay. Then a great stone, not cut by human hands, came crashing down out of the sky and smashed the statue, blasting it into dust, which then blew away. The stone grew into a mountain and filled the entire earth. Daniel interpreted the king's dream. He explained that the head was Nebuchadnezzar himself, and each medal down was a successive empire. The great smashing stone represented the God of heaven, who will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. What Daniel describes, the story of Jesus' return, can be found in Revelation 19-20. Jesus rides with the armies of heaven down to the earth, conquers evil, and then sets up that Davidic kingdom. Not once or even twice, but six times in Revelation 20, we're told that his kingdom will last a thousand years. And that number is where this kingdom gets its most recognized title, the Millennial Kingdom. The Bible is chock full of verses that explain how awesome it will be to live in the Millennial Kingdom. When we read the Bible for its plain sense meaning, it describes the following 12 points that define this kingdom. Number one, all the Jews first have to be regathered and back into the land of Israel. Number two, the world must endure the horrors of God's wrath during the day of the Lord. Number three, Jesus has to return physically to conquer Satan. Number four, the human world order has to be destroyed. Number five, the world must then be judged so only those saved will enter the millennial kingdom. Number six, Jesus will rule and reign as both king and priest from his temple in Jerusalem. Number seven, King David and the resurrected saints fill the leadership roles. Number eight, 
The Jews will serve as an exalted priestly people. Number nine, all the world's inhabitants will personally know Jesus and worship him. Number 10, war will cease to exist. Animals won't kill each other. It'll be a world of peace and bounty. Number 11, lifespans will be counted in the hundreds of years. Number 12, Satan is bound in a pit for a thousand years and so can't tempt anyone. That is until the very end when he is released to be permanently defeated. Clearly nothing like these conditions exist today, so the millennial kingdom is still future. So will Jesus rule the earth for a thousand years? Most absolutely yes. Jesus will literally return to set up his literal throne over a literal kingdom that will last literally for a thousand years and then on into eternity. For when that incredible time finally comes, another astounding prophecy will be fulfilled and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. To get more answers for the end times, subscribe to this channel and please visit us at ChristinProphecy.org.